this is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 24, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 15. Divine Provision for Moral Excellence. Hey, how's it going? My name is Herb Bateman. I'm glad to see you back again as we, um, we advance our studies in the general letters. And uh, here, uh, we're going to focus on 2 Peter. Uh, once again, I just want to talk about uh, the fact that we began with James, written between 45 and 49. Then we went to Jude, written between 62 and 66. And then we went to Hebrews, which is probably written between 64, 68, somewhere between the the fall before the fall of the Jewish temple. But the thing that they had in common, all three of those uh, letters, was that uh, they were written to Jewish Christians. Um, Jewish Christians in the diaspora, in the case of James. Jewish Christians in Judea, who were uh, 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 trying to decide and figure out, how do I handle this Jewish revolt? And then Jewish Christians in Rome. Then we, um, then we began looking at the letters that have been written and composed to, uh, in all probability, a mixed audience. And when I say a mixed audience, I mean an audience that is both uh, Jew and Gentile um, followers of Jesus. And the first letter we looked at was Peter, as he is writing from Rome to a group of churches in Bithynia, Galatia, Asia, Pontus, and that northern Galatia area or thereabouts, and in what would be modern-day Turkey. Second Peter, I think, is written to the same group of people, though not as explicitly stated. Um, I think it's a follow-up letter, and I think uh, that um, Peter, Second Peter, is clearly identifying and wrestling with. Um, um, false teachers. Um, he, he mentions the fact that he's dealing with false teachers. He, he, he gives hints uh, as to um, the false teachings that he is addressing. Um, in fact, um, in this work I did on interpreting the general letters, I deal with some um, historical issues uh, and how the Greco-Roman world is uh, somehow um, being addressed in, um, uh, in these letters. And one of the things um, I point out is that in all probability, uh, and I'm not alone on this uh, estimation, um, Peter appears to be speaking against the Epicurean teaching. Remember, we're... Uh, uh, um, we're talking about an Epicurean, I mean, a um, Greco-Roman world um, where uh, various philosophies and uh, perspectives are, are given. And you had uh, Stoics uh, who were very um, moralistic and Epicureans that tend to, to have a, a license on things. And it seems that um, uh, Peter, in, th in this writing, may be addressing uh, Epicurean-like Teachings. I don't want to say necessarily that they're Epicureans, but they are a group of people that have uh, crept into the church that are that are um, um, uh, ep uh, teaching Epicurean-like teachings to attain uh, a life of pleasure, and we see this in two ver chapter two verse thirteen. Um, uh, while Peter affirms an afterlife and defined judgment, um, it tends to be denied within Epicurean teachings. And so it is perhaps that this, is, uh, this may be something that Peter is addressing in 3, 10 to 12. And then um, Peter speaks against the Epicureans' rejection of prophecy, which was another uh, take of uh, uh, the Epicureans. So, and um, uh, once again, this is not unique to me. Uh, Karen Jobes, who has uh, written on this, who teaches at Wheaton, um, has written... Uh, uh, commentary on First Peter, and then has done some work in a, uh, a, a general uh, work on the general epistles, and she brings some of these things out. So there's more work that you could investigate. Um, so 
Uh, I look at 2 Peter, and he's clearly dealing with false teachers and false teaching, and he explicitly states that. Now, one of the challenges that um, exists um, for me uh, as a one who has written a commentary on Jude, at least I'm being told that this is a challenge that exists for me, is that I look at Jude and um, I'm recognizing that many evangelicals today uh, consider Jude, the brother of Jesus, uh, to have written the book of Jude, the letter. Um, that Jude is writing sometime before the fall of, uh, of the temple. Uh, and I place it between 62 and 66 uh, because James is, is dead and uh, Jude is addressing issues in Judea because there's a, um, a leadership vacuum. And so he, he is addressing an issue. And the question is, what's that issue? Uh, many will, uh, the pervasive view out there is that Jude is addressing false teachers. However, when you put Jude in Judea, between 62 and 66, or even you want to make it 50, 58 to 70, as um, uh, Ben Witherington does. Ben Witherington recognizes that J Jude is addressing the, the, uh, the, the issues of, uh, of what's going on in Judea. I just happen to specify those issues are rebellion. Um, Judea is not known for false teaching. They're known for denying Jesus as Messiah. They're known for uh, rebellion and uh, people rising up and calling themselves Messiah, uh, which is in keeping with their, their theological constructs. But Judea is they're not known for false teachers. Um, so I, I look at Jude, and I see Jude uh, having been written for uh, Judeans to address a false teacher issue. I mean, a, uh, a rebellion issue, not a false teacher issue. Now, the challenge that I'm supposed to have with regards to that view is that 2 Peter clearly focuses on false teachers, which uh, I readily admit. I, I yield. I confess. I say, yes, I agree. But does that mean that Jude has to be addressing false teachers? Does that mean that uh, Jude could not be addressing a different audience with different issues, but using some of the same, um, some of the same Jewish texts? Certainly. Is it possible that uh, Peter may be using the same text as Jude, but yet addressing a false teacher issue? Certainly. Anything is possible. Now, when it comes to looking at this reliance between Jude and 2 Peter, which is, which is something that um, uh, every commentator has to address, is uh, there are generally three options that are um, suggested. Um, it, it's considered one of the most, according to Schreiner, who is written in the Knack commentary series, he says, quote, one of the most vexing issues when interpreting Jude and 2 Peter is how to explain the relationship between them. So I don't care if you take my view that Jude is written to rebellious Judean, about rebellious Judeans in Judea and him addressing uh, Christians to stay out of that rebellion because rebellion raises the ire of God and, and judgment, or you take and, and then take 2 Peter as being addressing false teachers. I don't care if you take that view or you take that both are addressing false teacher views. It's the most vexing issue regardless, okay? Whether you consider both books addressing false teachers or you take it the right way. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Uh, you take it my way in seeing that Jude is addressing rebelling and encouraging believers to stay out of the Jewish revolt and accept Peter is addressing a totally different issue, though the material may have parallels. It's, a, it's vexing. I don't care what, what position you have. So that's, in, that's admitted right up front. So let's just, let's just put that right out there. Um, uh, we have to acknowledge that in a number of verses, the two letters have remarkable parallels. Not a problem. You have remarkable parallels between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, 
to what extent did they use each other? Uh, to what extent may they have used Illichoris tradition? To what extent may they have used a combination of both? Um, uh, oral tradition and a literary source. Um, it, you know, uh, you've got, um, uh, so that, that, this, that issue is not, not unique to the New Testament. So parallels would be even closer if cited in Greek. And he's going to cite some parallels in, uh, in the NIV. But um, just for the sake of a, an English reader. And so he cites these parallels and some of these parallels. And if, you, um, if we were to look closely and look at uh, uh, 2 Peter 2.1, um, you'll see parallels with verse 4 of Jude. If you look at 2 Peter 2.2, 2, you'll see parallels with Jude 4. Um, so um, uh, just, just be frank and honest that you know, there are parallels, and, um, and I, I, I confess to that. So, um, so there's, um, <coughs> excuse me. So there are typically three plausible options that tend to be forward, put forward here. One, Second Peter is dependent on Jude. Two, Jude is dependent on Second Peter. Three, they are both dependent on either, are d both dependent on either a written or oral source, or perhaps a combination of them of both. Most scholars now believe Peter depends on Jude. That Second Peter depends on Jude. Most most um, scholars will agree to that. Um, Jude would have written his letter otherwise, uh, since he restates much of Peter. On the other hand, a significant number of scholars still defend the view that Jude drew from 2 Peter. Um, each of these theories is plausible. We should not, for instance, rule out the notion that both writers, writers drew from a common source. A shared written tradition would seem to be required if one defends this view, since the words and themes are strikingly same. A teacher receiving Jude and Second Peter would certainly wonder about the literary relationship between the two views. Now, so uh, for those of you who are sitting out there and maybe asking me, um, what, um, how are you reconciling these um, similarities between Second Peter and Jude. Um, I am of the opinion that Jude was written first and that Jude is addressing a rebellion in Judea. Um, I believe that Jude is uh, using uh, uh, typical um, uh, stories um, that are part of Jewish tradition. Uh, remember in, in um, verse 5, he says, um, Now I want you to remember, although you know all these things, and then he gives three examples, one from the Exodus, one from angels, in Genesis uh, 6, and then one about Sodom and Gomorrah. These are tr typical Jewish traditions concerning the bad and the ugly that is part and parcel of uh, Jewish past or stories of the past. Peter is, is, is um, making use of those same stories, but, keep, uh, but um, excludes one and includes another, a different one. Um, so you have, uh, and both Jude and Peter, are from Judea, and they're aware of these traditions that circulated throughout of all of Judea. Certainly would have been well aware of uh, Enoch, um, uh, one Enoch with regards to um, uh, uh, second, uh, second Temple literature. So they have a common background. They have a common Jewish background, and I think they're just using the same sources. Is it possible that Peter had Jude in front of him? Anything is possible. Um, and it's also possible that he may have, um, if he did have Jude, which I can't prove, but if he did have Jude in front of him, um, he used Jude in a way to address the issues he was concerned about, false teachers. Jude was concerned about rebellion. Peter makes it perfectly clear that he's addressing false teachers. There is no false teaching in Jude. There are no mention of false teachers in Jude. There is an emphasis on rebelling, and don't rebel, God punishes rebellion. And, and the, the whole emphasis is um, uh, the rebellion of the past and rebellion that's currently going on. Uh, there's nothing in there about teaching. 
Peter is addressing teaching. And he's going to address teaching using Jewish background material. Whereas Jude addresses rebellion using Jewish background material, Peter is addressing false teaching using the same Jewish background material. So if Peter used Jude, that would be my argument. My question is, how did he get Jude way over there in Rome? It's not impossible, but nobody addresses that question. Is it possible that, Jude is, that Peter and Jude are using a, a, a similar source, a written source? Or is it possible that their, their oral tradition is so close it comes out with verbal parallels? Um, I, you know, I don't think we can prove one way or the other um, that um, Peter didn't or did use Jude. Um, but I think we can argue pretty firmly that the, the issues that Jude is addressing because of the context is different than the issues that 2 Peter is addressing. So the issue of who used who or what is just as vexing for me as it is for those who want to see Jude addressing false teachers. I mean, uh, as Jude addressing false teachers and 2 Peter addressing false teachers. It's a vexing problem no matter what your view is concerning Jude. Um, it doesn't make it any easier if you say that Jude is written to false teachers just like 2 Peter is. It doesn't make it any easier. Um, so, uh, so for the, for the sake of our lesson or for the sake of our, our, our uh, discussion, um, I just, let me just reiterate that I once again uh, affirm that Jude, written by Jude to Judeans, is, is uh, between 62 and 66, is focusing on addressing a real problem that existed in Judea, rebellion. And, Jude is, and, and Judea is not known for having a lot of false teachers. Second Peter, on the other hand, written between 66 and 68, towards the end of Peter's life, is addressing uh, a Greco-Roman um, uh, group of people living in a, a province of, in, within the Greco-Roman world where um, uh, Epicurean-type thinking uh, was prominent, and it's um, infiltrating the church, and he's addressing this, uh, this teaching uh, as being false teaching and ought not to be assimilated uh, and uh, intermingled with the gospel about Jesus Christ. So there you have it, as we, we think about these two letters, how they are similar, similar only in uh, Jewish background material that might emerge, but different concerning the issues that they address. So I hope that will uh, set your mind at ease, and if you'd like to read more on uh, my perspective concerning um, uh, Jude being written to, uh, Judea, to Judeans, revolting in Judea. Uh, you're welcome to um, go to uh, the evangelical exegetical commentary on Jude. It's uh, uh, available in both digital and hard copy with Logos. Um, I also have a journal article where I uh, deal with this as well, uh, published in Bibsac, and I do believe it was in 2013. Okay, now with that, we want to um, uh, move our discussion to looking at 2 Peter. And when we look at 2 Peter, um, uh, 2 Peter can be divided into um, um, several sections. Um, and uh, when I look at um, 2 Peter, I, I see a, a salutation that runs from chapter 1, verse 1, to verse 11. And um, this opening salutation um, has three parts. One part is um, of the salutation is typical of a, a letter where he, there's a, uh, a sender, a recipient, and a greeting. Then, um, then Peter moves into talking about divine provisions, divine provisions. And then he moves to divine provision for moral excellence. So the opening of Jude, I mean of 2 Peter, 
uh, is a salutation that runs from 1-1 one, one to verse 11. But I've, I've called this opening um, divine provision for moral excellence. So that's how I've labeled this though uh, it is just a subsection of the entire opening salutation. Then um, he moves into uh, providing um, the purpose for the book, uh, verses 12 through 15. And then he moves into the apologetic response about the eyewitness testimony. And this is where he deals with issues like fact or fiction, um, um, eyewitness account being fact, then he moves into talking about false teachers and final judgment, um, assumptions about God's judgment, uh, portrayal of false teachers. So these are all um, uh, sections of 2 Peter, and it's clear in 2 Peter he's addressing false teaching. So let's begin by um, looking at the salutation, and we want to look at um, the divine uh, provision for moral excellence that appears in the first 11 verses. And I may even introduce the purpose of the book in verses 12 to 15. But let's begin with um, uh, Peter's um, opening salutation. From Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus, who is the Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus, who is, in, who is the Christ, have been granted a faith just as precious as ours. May grace and peace be lavished on you as you grow in the rich knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus, and, and of Jesus our Lord. So we have uh, the opening of uh, the letter, um, almost similar and identical to the one in, sec in 1 Peter. Um, in 1 Peter, we have uh, Peter identify himself as from Peter, an apostle of Jesus. Here he names himself as Simon Peter, um, a slave. So emphasizing the fact that he is a slave, not just not a servant. And we spoke a little bit about this in Jude, when Jude also describes himself as a slave, that he is totally committed, his, uh, his owner is Jesus, Messiah, his king, um, with no rights, no, no uh, no rights um, as like you would think about a slave in Greco-Roman world. A slave had no rights. He also, again, identifies himself as an apostle. And once again, just want to state that uh, uh, First and Second Peter are the only two letters where you see the writers identifying themselves as apostles. Um, Hebrews doesn't uh, have an opening, so there's no identification. Uh, James is a... Is a um, is, um, um, a servant of, um, or a slave of uh, Jesus, uh, the Messiah. Jude persuades himself as a slave of Jesus Messiah, the brother of James. Um, uh, the Johannine letters, uh, who I happen to believe uh, um, John wrote them, uh, he refers to himself as an elder. So of all the general letters, when we think of the, um, the eight uh, general letters, only two. Um, uh, are um, identified as being written by an apostle. Um, this is not to say John isn't an apostle. It is just to say that um, he doesn't identify himself as an apostle. He uh, makes it clear that he's writing to those um, through the righteousness of God uh, and Savior. Uh, the idea of God and Savior, I think it's important to note that both refer to the same person, that is Jesus, uh, who is the Christ. This is one of the clearest statements in the New Testament about the deity of Jesus. Um, I make mention of that in my book on the interpreting of the general letters. Um, there are several places where uh, this is what we call a, uh, a Granville Sharp rule construction, uh, and um, where you have a, an article noun uh, joined by Kai, uh, and and, and in such a construction, the two are a descriptive of the same person. In this case, it's a description of Jesus as being both God and Savior. It's affirming the deity of Jesus. So we see um, the deity of Jesus affirmed in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 5 to 13, where Jesus is described, or the Son is described as the divine, royal, messianic Son of promise. 
And now we have a, a clear statement here in Peter where uh, Jesus is declared both God and Savior. Um, and then, uh, then he notes that his re recipients have been granted a faith that is just as precious as ours. So Peter is not distinguishing uh, uh, his faith in Jesus as being any different than their faith in Jesus. Um, and so he's, he's recognizing some sort, uh, a sort of uh, uh, equality in belief uh, between the two. Um, and then uh, he, he uses a very typical greeting, may grace and peace be lavished on you. Now we saw this in, in, um, in uh, Jude as well where he, in his greeting, uh, um, says that may uh, mercy, grace, and peace be lavished on you. And then, of course, he comes back to that at the end of the letter to say how you are to manifest um, grace on others since you've been lavished with it. So this, this idea of um, mercy, uh, uh, grace, and peace um, will uh, probably resurface again in, in Second Peter. And then he talks about growing in the rich knowledge of God and of our Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. And so, it, it, and he is going to address cognitive issues about Jesus because he's dealing with false teachers. He's not dealing with conduct like Jude is about rebellion. He's dealing with, con he's dealing with cognitive knowledge about who Jesus is. And that's the difference between the use of sources too. Okay. All right. So having having um, having uh, presented a typical uh, opening salutation, um, Peter now moves into talking about divine provision. Um, divine provision that God has given. Um, he has given uh, the provision of divine power to believers for both life and duty. And how he does it, he does it by knowledge of either. God or Jesus that has a rather significant result that believers may share in God's nature. How? By escaping the world's corruption. So let's look at verses 3 and 4. I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these things he has bestowed on us his precious and most magnificent promises with this result, so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire, for, uh, for evil desire, and we'll stop there. Um, this idea of called uh, that, uh, that appears in verse 3 um, is used here in, its, uh, in a, a form that uh, it has so, soteriological uh, ramifications. God is the subject who calls uh, these recipients, and it always carries some, some type of uh, an efficacious and effective call. Uh, and... Um, he doesn't have to qualify call here like he did, it, like the Jewish readers or the Jewish authors did, like James and Jude, because the Jewish people believed they were called. So they had to nuance what they meant by who the called ones were. Here, Peter, writing to a mixed group, just talks to them both, talks to this group as being called in a, in a very general uh, and non-defining um, or descriptive sense. Um, so let's talk about, uh, first of all, the fact that God has provided provisions for living. Um, the basis for Peter's desires for the followers to experience grace and peace in abundance is because God's power has been provided to live life and be godly. I pray this. What? Well, it's taking you right back to verse 2 about grace and peace being lavished on you to grow. I pray that you may have grace and peace lavished on you and uh, grow in knowledge because his divine power has bestowed everything on us. Um, and then he moves into talking about the knowledge of God and his promises. 
the means by which we as followers or any followers uh, of Jesus may experience God's power is by knowing God's promises. Now here we go again. The importance of knowing God's promises or God's big picture. We've said this many times um, throughout the course of our study in the general letters. God is in the process of reestablishing his kingdom rule and to redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. And that program was began way back in the beginning after the first sin between Adam and Eve. And rather than annihilating the entire created order and starting again, he sets into motion a plan to reestablish that, that kingdom rule and to redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. And he does it through promises, the promise of Abraham, David, the new promise, which finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, the messianic son of promise. So the means by which followers of Jesus may experience his power is by knowing God and his promises. Um, and uh, that is power that enables us to live life and be godly. Um, I th um, and then the results of this, uh, of God's promise in believers, has a twofold effect. They are currently partners with God, and they eventually escape the world's corruption. So uh, as I think about this train of thought, um, let me um, flesh this out, and for the sake of um, 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 repetition, uh, talk about verses 3 and 4 in this manner. God has given divine power to believers for life and duty. How? By way of knowledge of either God or Jesus that is rather significant, uh, that has a rather significant result, that believers may share in God's nature. How? By escaping the world's corruption. We share in God's nature by being able to escape the corruption of the world. Um, then he moves to verses 5 to 7. And here in 5 to 7, he's going to talk about divine provision for moral excellence. Now listen as we read these verses uh, from 5 to 11. Followers of Jesus are expected to initiate moral ex excellence in their lives because striving for moral excellence prevents ungodliness. Now listen to how this, this verse unfolds. For this very reason, this is talking about escaping moral excellence uh, because of a partaker's divine nature and escaping worldly corruptions, Make every effort, now what are we supposed to be making an effort in? To add to your faith excellence. Now he's already identified the fact that uh, they have a similar faith. That, uh, that, uh, that they have been granted a faith just as precious as he and the apostles have. So, um, he's, so he's, he's saying... Um, to them, I want you to make any effort to expand and build on that faith that's just like ours. Um, add to your faith excellence. To excellence, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly love or brotherly affection. To brotherly affection, unselfish love. For if these things are really yours and are continually increasing, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your pursuit of knowing our Lord Jesus, who is the Christ, from knowing our Lord Jesus more ultimately, uh, intimately. But concerning the one who lacks such things, he is blind. That is to say, he is nearsighted, since he has forgotten about the cleansing of his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to be sure of your calling and election, for by doing this you will never stumble into sin. For thus an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, will be richly provided for you. So followers of Jesus in these verses are expected to initiate, initiate moral excellence in their lives because striving to do so prevents ungodliness. Verses 5 to 7, if we were to 
um, look at uh, initiating this moral excellence, uh, we might be able to say it in this manner. Peter tells how he expects believers to move from believing faith to moral excellence, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly love, and a self-denying love. How? By taking an initiative. And you see the progression. Faith moving to knowledge, moving to eventually acts of love. Faith produces. Sound familiar? Just like James. Faith without works is dead, ineffective. J J Peter is saying something similar when he's, he runs through this grocery list of, of, uh, of activities. By taking the initiative, this is our responsibility as believers. As believers, we are to take the initiative to add to our faith excellence. To excellence, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance, which of course is important for suffering, learning how to make it through suffering. To perseverance, godliness, in the process of suffering, being godly uh, in your suffering. To godliness, brotherly affection, and to brother, brotherly affection, unselfish love, agape love. Um, each, uh, in, in, uh, each item uh, begins with an, and so you, it's, uh, it, it's demonstrating a, a continuation and a metaphor that builds and builds and builds and builds and climaxes with selfish love, selfless love. Um, so uh, verses uh, um, 5 through 8 are extremely important for um, initiating moral excellence. And the reason for initiating this moral excellence is, uh, is based upon a twofold assumption uh, about a believer's progression from faith to love. Peter reasons that believers will be uh, fruitful and that those who lack the faith to love are blind. And we're going to see uh, this as we move into verses uh, 8 to 9. For if these things are really yours, that's, that's an assumption for the sake of the argument, they will keep you from becoming ineffective and unproductive in your pursuit of knowing the Lord Jesus more intimately. And then he talks about if you don't, uh, aren't pursuing these, then you are blind. So uh, in looking and summarizing this thought, we might say it in this way. Uh, uh, through these through these verses, um, he's saying, based upon a twofold assumption about a believer's progression from faith to love, Peter reasons that believers will fruitful and, con and concludes those who lack the faith to love are blind. If you cannot love, he says you're blind. Now he's not talking about literally blind but you were spiritually blind. Why? Because they have chosen to forget what God has done for them. And you know what it is they've, they've forgotten? That God forgives. God forgives. So if we can't love others um, in the body, outside of the body, um, we are spiritually blind. And some of that, and that blindness is because we have forgotten what it means for God to forgive us. Um, I mean, do you remember when you got saved, the first time you got saved, how humbling it was? You recognize how, how wretched a person you are. We sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Do those mean words mean anything to you anymore? Or do we just sing them out of rote memory? Have we forgotten what it means to be forgiven? We need to be ready to forgive the minute that someone repents and says, I'm sorry. 
But forgiveness is, and so forgiveness is very much a part of being a Christian, a part of being a follower of Jesus. And if we can't forgive, if we, if we, can, if we can't love, then we have forgotten God's um, great love exercised and extended to us by forgiving us. The expectation of all believers in verses 10 and 11 uh, uh, is to be certain about our salvation. It says in verse 10, look what it says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to be sure of your calling and election. For by doing so, or by doing this, you will never stumble into sin. Sounds almost like Paul, doesn't it? Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Make every effort to be sure of your calling and your election. Um, apathy. Uh, there really is no room in, uh, uh, in our walk with Jesus to be apathetic. Um, Hebrews was concerned about it. Peter is obviously concerned about it, and I think he's concerned about it because the church is under attack by false teachers. False teachers are um, um, making inroads um, into the church, and it's important to know your Bible. It's important to know what God's Word says. Um, what exactly is God's Word about? It's important if you're going into ministry, you go to a school that teaches the Bible. You study the Bible. If you don't study the Bible, what message are you going to bring to the people you preach to? And people need to know the Bible. You need to know the Bible so we can address false teachings and false. And knowing the Bible helps us say no to sin. For, for thus an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior will be richly provided for you. The assumed expectation for those who struggle to ensure the genuineness of their faith is entrance into the kingdom. Now, um, since we have the time, I'm going to go ahead and move on to verses 12 and 15, which deals with the, um, um, the letter's purpose. The letter's purpose. Um, verses 12 to 13 uh, gives the reasons believers are to be reminded of their need for moral excellence. And it's simply because of this. The end is near. The end is near. Listen to verses um, uh, 12 through 14. Therefore, I intend to remind you constantly of these things, even though you know them and are well established in the truth that you now have. So um, it almost sounds like Jude doesn't. I, I want you to remember these things. Oh, I, want you, I want you to pause. I, I want you to remember. Um, although you know these things. Now listen to how Peter is doing the same thing. Uh, uh, I intend to remind you constantly of these things, even though you know them and are well established in the truth that you now have. The idea of bringing things into remembrance, is it that Peter is using Jude or Jude is using Peter? Or is it just, just a common thing that both writers are bringing out? I want you to remember this. Memory, remembering things of the past, remembering things that have taken place in your life. This is just part and parcel of, of thinking. Re do you remember when you were saved? Didn't I just do that? Have we forgotten what it means to be forgiven? Have, do, have we forgotten the days when we, when we uh, first got saved? Uh, I could have said it in this way. Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember? I know you know these things. Just take, for instance, Amazing Grace. Do you just remember that discussion we just had? Peter is doing the same type of thing. I, want, I, I intend to remind you constantly of these things, even though you know them. Indeed, as long as I am in this tabernacle. Okay, so what's he doing? Wearing a tent? Uh, <laughs> this is just figurative language. Uh, you know how Paul talks about the flesh and how... Uh, Jesus died in the flesh, or uh, we are to become um, uh, members, we are to become one flesh with our spouse. The word flesh becomes uh, a metaphor for the, a person. 
Well, here in um, 2 Peter, the tabernacle, he's talking about his flesh. He's talking about his body. As long as I'm in this body, as long as I'm alive, I consider it right to stir you up by way of a reminder. So, so he's saying, um, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be a I'm going to be like a tick on a dog. I, I'm going to I'm going to bite you every now and then to keep you keep your keep your uh, uh, to to remind you of certain. I'm going to be like a tick on a dog. As long as I'm alive, I consider it right to stir you up, to give you a bite behind the ear like a tick on a dog might do. Since I know that my tabernacle will soon be removed, well, now he's recognizing um, I'm, I'm going to die soon. Now, because of this, uh, there are some, and I think it's Buchanan who argues uh, most definitively uh, for this view. He considers 2 Peter not to be a letter, but to be a last will and testament uh, because of language like this. Um, I still happen to see this as being a letter, uh, opening and closing salutation, or at least the opening salutation and closing doxology, which parallels what we see in, in Jude to some extent. Um, and we see uh, you know, uh, closing doxologies in Paul as well in Romans. Um, but, um, but I do see this a letter. But what he's doing is he says, I, since I know my tabernacle will soon be removed. Just a metaphor that um, since I know I'm about to die, I'm, I'm going to die. Um, but as long as I'm alive, you know, in, until I breathe my last breath, I am going to uh, stir you up by way of a reminder. Because, and here's his reasons why, the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ, has revealed this to me. Now, uh, the question is, what's this? Uh, when Peter says, our Lord Jesus revealed this to me, he is no doubt referring to the prophecy that is partially recorded in John 21, 18 to 19. So let's look at John 21, 18 to 19. So, we have, I tell you the solemn truth. When you, oh, make sure I got the right verse there. Yes, 21, 89. I tell you the solemn truth. When you were young, you tied your clothes around you and went wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hand and others will tie you up and bring you where you do not want to go. Now, Jesus said this to indicate clearly by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. And after he said this, Jesus told Peter, follow me. First Peter is about what? Following Jesus in the way of suffering. Here, Jesus is looking at Peter and talking about the kind of death that Peter would be uh, exposed to. And then Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Here we have, um, the Lord revealed this to me. What is this? Peter, uh, the Lord Jesus revealed to Peter the death he was going to suffer. And Peter is following Jesus in that form of suffering. Indeed, he says in verse 15, I will also make every effort that after my departure, you will have a testimony of these things. And here, these are, uh, there is various interpretation of verse 15. Um, for example, um, Peter could be saying simply, I will make every effort that you remember these things, but the, uh, um, uh, but the collocution uh, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, mene, or remain, suggests a more specific in image. Um, it is possible that um, 
there are two words that suggest a desire to write some sort of letter or testament. Um, this is difficulty. Most commentators wrestle with verse 15 and, and what does it recognize uh, or how to interpret it. Um, but they look at this as some type of um, um, future um, um, uh, testimony as referring to Peter himself, Second Peter himself. Uh, some suggest that Mark's gospel is in view when we talk about, indeed, I will also make every effort after my departure. You have a testimony of these things. Perhaps this testimony of things is um, um, the gospel of Mark itself. Could be this letter. Could be the gospel of Mark. Um, the other uh, possibility um, uh, might be that Peter is, uh, um, is, unwittingly, uh, is an unwitting source behind Mark's gospel, that these things would uh, seem to refer at least to the prophecy about Peter's death absent in Mark. Um, we really don't know. We don't know exactly what testimony of these things is talking about. Buchanan will say um, it's the letter. Uh, uh, perhaps it is the Gospel of Mark. We really don't know. It is a difficult verse. But the fact is that he is going to make every after, after he dies, after he departs from this world, that he's going to leave something for him. It could be something that we don't even have anymore. So, uh, but the purpose of his writings is... Um, to uh, remind them of um, the kingdom, uh, the things that you know are well established in the truth. So uh, we've begun our study in Peter. We've spent a good time talking about the relationship between in Jude, uh, Jude and Second Peter. I hope you understand my difference between the two letters. Two totally different situations, two totally different audiences. Though some of their material may overlap, that may be due to oral tradition or perhaps maybe even a written source they may be sharing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Peter used Jude, though it's possible. I can't prove it, nor can I disprove it. In the meantime, I trust that you will find encouragement in Peter's exhortations and expectations that we have divine provisions to live a morally excellent life that begins with faith, but has its ultimate manifestation in acts of selfless love. Walk with the King and be a blessing. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number 24, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 15. Divine Provision for Moral Excellence.